Hello and welcome Star Wars fans to Conja Club. Today we're presenting our first video in a series that asks the question, can the Star Wars prequels be saved? Can we shed new light on these much maligned movies and allow fans that have hated them for over a decade now to begin to embrace them? We're going to jump right in and talk about the most hated thing to come out of the prequels not called Jar Jar Binks. That's right, Medichlorians. So why didn't Obi-Wan or Yoda ever mention Medichlorians to Luke? Now of course there's the obvious and simple answer. George Lucas hadn't thought of them yet when he made the original trilogy. Knowing this, we're then left to assume and imagine that at some point, off-screen, one of them actually did talk to Luke about midichlorians and their importance. Well, who wants to believe that? So what if there's another reason why they never did tell Luke about midichlorians? What if they didn't tell him because they didn't need to tell him, because they weren't that important to being a Jedi? What if the Jedi of the prequel era had it all wrong about midichlorians and they actually contributed to the downfall of the Jedi? What if there's a really good reason why midichlorians will never again be mentioned in a Star Wars movie without having to pretend they never existed in the first place? Sound like wishful thinking that goes against everything we know about midichlorians? Well first of all, what do we really know about midichlorians? I'm not talking about what people think they know about midichlorians, because a lot of people have it all wrong. From a few bad scenes in the prequels, they've gotten the impression that the midichlorians are the force or that they generated or act as some kind of Jedi power meter depending on how many you have in your cells. None of these are even close to the truth. So let's quickly go back to the places in the actual canon where midichlorians are mentioned and figure out what they really are. And don't worry, there actually isn't many such instances. After that, I'll put forth a theory that not only will do away with the need for them to ever be mentioned again, all the while keeping their already established place in the canon intact, but may start to change your opinion of them forever. The very first time we ever hear midichlorians mentioned is when Qui-Gon takes a sample of young Anakin's blood in the Phantom Menace and asks Obi-Wan for a midichlorian count. We learn that Anakin's count is over 20,000, higher than even Master Yoda's. That such a high count seems pretty unusual. The problem with this scene is that it tells us absolutely nothing about what midichlorians actually are, but allows us to make some big and wild assumptions about what they might be, mainly that the more you have, the more powerful you can become. The next time we hear midichlorians mentioned is also in The Phantom Menace right before our heroes return to Naboo for the final confrontation. It's a terrible one minute piece of exposition that a lot of Star Wars fans think ruined the Force forever. Anyway, Qui-Gon tells Anakin that midichlorians are microscopic life forms that live inside all living cells and that life couldn't exist without them. He goes on to tell Anakin that the midichlorians constantly speak to them and tell them the will of the Force, assuming you can quiet your mind enough to hear them. And if it wasn't for these little creatures living in our cells, we'd have no knowledge of the Force. We get a lot of information about midichlorians here, and if you really pay attention, all he's saying is that midichlorians are needed for life to exist and that the Force can talk to you through them, like there's some sort of intermediary. Nowhere does he say anything to the effect that they are the Force or that they generate the Force. They just tell you the will of the Force. That's it. The next and last time we hear about midichlorians in the prequel movies is during what is arguably one of the best damn scenes in the whole trilogy, that being the Opera House scene, where Palpatine tells Anakin the tragedy of Darth Plagueis the Wise. Though we don't actually learn anything about the midichlorians themselves here, we have it affirmed that their existence is important for life to exist since they can be manipulated to keep people alive or even create life itself. More importantly, especially for the theory I'm about to put forth, we learn that the Sith have a great deal of interest in them and likely have been studying them for a long time. We can assume this because they believe that they're the key to the immortality, something all Sith want to achieve since they believe the here and now is all that matters. Either way, they've clearly know, they clearly know a lot about them and have been attempting to manipulate them to do all sorts of things. The real question I'm left with here is, what else can Sith do with midichlorians? Could they even be using them against the Jedi? Now let's discuss the most significant information about the midichlorians we ever get, which comes to us from two episodes of the Clone Wars, those being Voices and Destiny, from the Yoda arc in Season 6. And yes, if you don't know, the Clone Wars is 100% canon, meaning it all happened in the same universe as the movies. If you're a Star Wars fan and you haven't seen them, you should. If you can't stomach the idea of watching cartoons, at least watch Season 6, because it had a lot of cool info about how Order 66 really went down and how Yoda started his training to become a Force Ghost. Anyway, during these two episodes, we learn a ton about what the Force is and where midichlorians really fit into the picture. To sum it all up as quickly and concisely as I can, we learn there are actually two parts to the Force. The Living Force, which is made up and generated by all living things, and the Cosmic Force, which all things that have ever lived turn into when they die. The cosmic force is also what actually holds the universe together. I think the cosmic force is the energy that surrounds and binds us, as Yoda so eloquently explained in The Empire Strikes Back, and the living force is the luminous beings that are stuck in the crude matter. These two parts of the force constantly replenish and refresh each other in a never-ending cycle. 
They're basically the same mystical energies, just in different forms. So when something dies, the luminous being that they were becomes a part of the cosmic force and loses its individuality. Unless, of course, they were trained to retain their consciousness when they joined with the cosmic force. This we learn in the episode of the Clone Wars is basically done by someone who is able to truly know themselves and overcome all fear when they die. So how do midi chlorians fit into this picture of the force? Well, they were the first life form in the galaxy and originated from this mysterious force planet that we know virtually nothing about other than what we see in this one episode. We know the existence of midi chlorians makes life possible, though how isn't exactly explained. Beyond that, all they do is allow the will of the cosmic force to be known by the living force. In other words, living people can simply hear what the cosmic force wants if they quiet their minds and hear the midi chlorians speaking to them. Honestly, just knowing the simple truth about midi chlorians might allow some people to already be more accepting of them, but I plan on going much further. First off, I don't think force users, such as Jedi, need to listen to the cosmic force via the midi chlorians. What makes you a force user in the first place isn't a lot of midi chlorians in yourselves. It's an innate ability to connect with and even command the cosmic force on your own, including communing with it instead of just listening to some little bugs in your body tell you what it wants. I even think only listening to the will of the force via midi chlorians can be detrimental to a Jedi. How could that possibly be, you no doubt ask? Because the force isn't on anybody's side. It doesn't favor the dark or the light. It simply wants to be in the constant state of balance and doesn't distinguish between good and evil the same way that we do or the characters in the Star Wars universe do. Now I'm not implying the force itself is sentient, nor am I implying it's not. It's probably beyond sentient in a sense we mere mortals couldn't possibly understand. Either way, I believe that's a question that doesn't need to be answered or even explored. It's good to leave some things a mystery. One way or another, balance is what the force always seeks, and it'll do whatever it has to do to achieve that balance, including playing a part in wiping out the Jedi who had the force way out of balance during the time of the prequels. Now you might be thinking that the Jedi want balance too, but in reality they don't. To oversimplify it, the Jedi always want there to be peace, freedom, and prosperity in the galaxy, for everything to be good, just, and fair. But everything everything good isn't balance, and just by existing, by solely using the light side of the force to influence events in the galaxy, the Jedi, perhaps you could argue inadvertently, tip the scales of balance in the favor of the light or good side of the force, which of course to us sounds like the right thing to do, but it's not balance. So if the Jedi exist and tip the scales towards light, there must be darkness to counterbalance things out. At the start of the prequels, there are yeah, 10,000 Jedi in the galaxy and two Sith, Darth Sidious and Darth Maul, possibly Count Dooku depending on how events exactly played out. As powerful as three Sith are, they don't balance out 10,000 Jedi invoking the power of the light side in the galaxy. So the will of the Force at this point is going to be to try to balance things out by diminishing the power of the Jedi or the light side and strengthening the power of the Sith or dark side. So if that's the case, if that's what the Force wants to accomplish, how wise is it for the Jedi to be listening and following the will of the Force at this point? Okay, so that leaves us with the question of why do the Jedi commune with the Force via the many clones in the first place if they don't have to, especially if it may not be giving them the best advice? Because they've fallen into a long and carefully laid out Sith trap. Sith who knew a lot more about many clones than the Jedi do. I'll explain. The Force Awakens implies that the first Jedi Temple has been lost for some time, so conceivably a lot of critical knowledge is lost with it, like exactly what a Jedi is supposed to be. This is why Luke probably went looking for it in the first place. He started to train new Jedi, failed, so now he wants to know just what it means to be a Jedi, how to get it right. Now I'm not implying that the prequel era Jedi had no idea how to be a Jedi, but I'm saying they got a lot of things wrong. I mean, they did lose to pretty much one mastermind Sith after all. Now I don't know when the first Jedi Temple went missing, but it was probably a very, very long time ago. Nor do I know why it was abandoned. Maybe it was due to a war, or maybe the whole planet flooded and they built a new home elsewhere. Who knows? The point I'm trying to make is that at least some crucial knowledge was lost to the Jedi, and the Jedi likely know that. Hence I think they've been looking for the temple for a very long time to reclaim that lost knowledge. I believe there are probably even Jedi out there, during the prequel era and before, who devote their lives to looking for the first temple and just seeking all the knowledge about the force they can along the way, and I think they're likely close to finding it during the time of the prequels, which begins to help explain why there's a map to it in The Force of Awakens. At some point in history, probably a while before the prequels take place, let's assume one of these Jedi Temple Hunters, for lack of a better name, came across an old holocron or some old scrolls that seem to have come from the first temple. Let's assume they give new insight on how the Jedi operated back in the day. What if it said these Jedi strictly listened to the cosmic force via many clones to know the true will of the force, and then the Jedi took up this old practice again? 
And what if this holocron book, or whatever it might have been, was actually a brilliantly crafted fake planted by the Sith who wanted the Jedi to listen to the will of the Force, a will that wanted nothing more than to balance things out once more, which eventually might allow the Sith to swing things back into their favor and rule the galaxy once more. And yes, the Sith are arrogant enough to believe that once they have things shifted in their favor again, they can keep it there indefinitely. You may be thinking this is all a bit of a stretch. Would the Jedi be dumb enough to fall into the Medichlorian trap? Would the Force really sabotage the Jedi and wouldn't the Jedi know it? Does it really matter how a Jedi communes with the Force? Wouldn't he or she get the same information if they connected with it directly? Let's examine those questions. Would the Jedi fall into this trap and start listening to the will of the Force via Medichlorians? Yes, quite possibly. According to Kai Adi Mundi in The Phantom Menace, the Jedi believed the Sith had been extinct for a millennia, and in that time they amassed an order that was 10,000 strong. Considering the dark side had seemingly not emerged, or at least hadn't posed any serious threat during this time, the Jedi probably assumed, wrongly, that their way was balancing the Force, that the light side needed to be that strong to constantly hold back and keep the dark side in check. They believed that was the will of the Force, that their way was the right way, and for a thousand years there was nothing to contradict that belief. Listening to the Medichlorians was working, it seemed, and they had no evidence to suggest otherwise till it was too late. Want proof that the Jedi thought their way was balancing the Force? When young Anakin was suggested by Qui-Gon to be the Chosen One to bring balance to the Force, the Jedi didn't seem too concerned that he was going to destroy them all and balance out the Force that way, meaning they didn't think they were, you know, they were currently unbalancing it. Yes, they were leery and concerned about him being trained and thought his future was clouded and that it might be dangerous, but in their wildest dreams they didn't see him being the cause of their demise. Why didn't the Force give the Jedi a grave warning about Anakin being trained instead of just cloudiness? Why didn't they get the memo from the Medichlorians? Because Anakin was eventually going to do exactly what the Force wanted, balance it. Keep in mind the Chosen One also showed up at the exact same time that the Sith apparently showed up for the first time in a thousand years. And though we didn't actually get to hear the exact wording of the prophecy, it's implied that the Chosen One will destroy the Sith and balance the Force. This would no doubt further affirm to the Jedi that they'd been doing things right the whole time, that, the old, that only now with the Sith coming back was the Force threatened to be unbalanced towards the dark side, and the Chosen One was needed to bring it back to, by defeating the Sith. Would the Force really sabotage the Jedi? Yes, absolutely. They have the Force way out of balance, and, as I already stated, and was hinted at in the Clone Wars, the Force doesn't really see light as being good and dark as being bad. They are simply aspects that need to be kept in balance, and it doesn't really matter to the Force which side has the balance out of whack, it just needs to be rectified. Wouldn't the Jedi know they're being sabotaged by the Force? They do know something is up around the time of the Clone Wars, but seem clueless to the whys and hows. Mace Windu even asks Yoda in Episode 2 that if they should reveal to the Senate that their ability to use the Force is diminishing. Yoda also comments about how blind they are when they find out the clone army exists, and that they should have seen his creation, but the Force didn't show it to them. Another missed memo from the Medichlorians, it seems. It also didn't show them that the Sith Lord camp was camped right underneath their nose, leading the Senate, and quite clearly Palpatine, who even chats with Jedi in his office, is well aware that the Jedi cannot sense his true nature or even guess at it till the bitter end of the Clone Wars when his actions, not anything the Jedi actually sends to or are told by the Force, start to betray the fact he's not this good guy they once thought him to be. And they just start to mistrust him and his motives, not suspect he has anything to do with the Sith, or may actually be one of them. It's not until Anakin discovers the truth and tells Mace Windu, who seems shocked by the news, that they finally learn the truth. Palpatine is Sidious. He's the Sith they've been looking for. So the Force was sabotaging them in all sorts of ways that, yes, were likely helped and spurred on by actions of the Sith, but clearly the Sith knew the Force would be on their side, and, expect, and exploited that fact, which is why they plotted long ago to have them hear the will of the Force via Medichlorians. Now, with that said, did it really matter that much that the Jedi were hearing the will of the Force via Medichlorians? Wouldn't they get the same information either way? No, I really don't think so. Though the Medichlorians themselves are completely benign and neutral, the message they send may not be. Still, they're just doing what they've always done, passing on the will of the Cosmic Force to those making up the Living Force. Also, with Midichlorians, there is only listening. There is no mention of talking back or asking questions, if you will. Now, when a Jedi communes directly with the Cosmic Force, I would think of it more as an interactive experience, one open to more interpretation and where questions could be asked by the Jedi itself. Remember what Yoda says to Luke in The Empire Strikes Back. Through the Force, things you will see, other places, the future, the past, old friends long gone. 
to me that sounds nothing like silence your mind and listen to the midichlorians. And he's not telling him to listen to midichlorians because at this point, Yoda no longer listens to the Force via them anymore himself. He knows that doing so helped lead to the downfall of the Jedi, and he's teaching Luke how to form his own connection with the Cosmic Force. He's teaching Luke the ideals of the Jedi so that he can apply them when communicating with the Force, so that he can act accordingly with the best interest of the Jedi, or light side of the Force, in mind. And keep in mind I'm not saying the Jedi during the prequel era and before couldn't or didn't commune with the Force directly. I'm simply implying they'd lost the ability or know-how or even desire to interpret what they should do without guidance from the midi clients. Again, they thought this was the right way, the way that was balancing the Force, so it only made sense for them to listen to its guidance. You may already see how this begins to answer one of the greatest mysteries the prequels left us with. Why didn't Obi-Wan and Yoda train Luke and Leia from infancy, as all Jedi had been trained before them? Because Yoda and Obi-Wan needed to retrain themselves on how to connect and commune with the Force without many chlorians before they could train anyone else. They had to become true Jedi again. They knew the Jedi had gotten many things wrong, and even though they may not have had all the right answers yet, answers Luke would later seek when he went looking for the first Jedi Temple, they certainly knew where they'd gone wrong and where the philosophies had failed them. They also understood the great importance and potential of becoming Force Ghosts of retaining their consciousness after death and joining with the cosmic force. They could basically become immortal power for the light side of the force, which may cause all kinds of issues with balance, but that's a debate for another time. Okay, so this theory still leaves at least one big problem to solve, the midichlorian power test. How do I explain this? Simple. First, I think it only makes sense that force users in general would have higher midichlorian counts than regular people. They'd be drawn to force users for obvious reasons, which means the presence of midichlorians indicates at least some degree of potential that's already there, not that the number or presence is the reason that there is potential. So when Jedi administer the test, they're simply looking for signs that midichlorians are attracted to this person because they're force sensitive. The actual number is irrelevant, only that it's higher than what it would be in a regular, non-sensitive being. It doesn't right away tell them how much potential a person has, just that there is potential there for them to become a Jedi because many chlorians are attracted to them. Also, who's to say a person's many chlorian count remains static? Your count may rise and fall throughout your lifetime for any number of reasons. So why does Anakin have such a high count when he's first tested? Because he was made by the many chlorians. Now I think he was made by Plagueis manipulating many chlorians, but that's another topic for another time. So perhaps the high number of midichlorians in Anakin is just a residual effect of being made from midichlorian manipulation. Why does Yoda have such a high count? Other than the fact that he's Yoda and is quite possibly the most powerful Jedi that has ever been and has lived a long life? Well, I believe Yoda is really old, even for his species. I believe he's been manipulating midichlorians for some time to simply keep himself alive, which would explain why you see him hobbling around with his cane or riding on his little hoverboard. And when you see him bouncing off walls and doing crazy flips with a lightsaber, that's him manipulating midichlorians to energize his body. In other words, he's not gimping around to put on a show or play possum. He really is in that poor of shape. So that brings us back to the original question. Why is Luke never told about midichlorians? Because there's no need to tell him. Yes, they play their part in the grand scheme of things, and I'm sure at some point he has learned about what they do and what they are, but that's it. They're not the key to being a Jedi or using force powers. They're intermediaries that, if you choose, allow you to listen to the will of the cosmic force that wants the galaxy to be in perpetual balance. That's it. Well, if you like this video, feel free to subscribe. We plan on doing a whole series of videos about saving the prequels by shedding new light and giving new explanations to all sorts of issues in these three movies. And we're going to do it not by changing the movies themselves, as many others have done in the past, like fan edits or rewrites or whatever it might be, but by leaving them 100% intact and simply giving new explanations, new perspectives that will construe the events we saw on screen during these movies in a new and different way. And again, if you like this video and want more theories that will help save the prequels, go ahead and subscribe. Have something to say? Tell it to Kanja Club and leave a comment below or message us on Twitter at tell underscore Kanja Club. The links are below.